What's up guys? Welcome to Anime Kahai. If you want to help me out, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. To calm his mind, I decided to lay out the conclusion Raphael led me to. Well, first off, it's important to think about things from the Empire's standpoint. If the Empire tried to attack the Western nations, what kind of strategy could they devise for that? Their goals for the attack were also key, but let's put that aside for the moment. If they wanted to wage war, they'd need to select an invasion route. There was a path straight through the forest of Jura, a harsher one over the Canaan Mountains, and a potential sea route, the old trade passage dating from before our highway system. And while it depended on how large a force the Empire sent, there were issues with every option. The sea route was a challenging one. It was the most direct path to the Kingdom of Pharmus, but once you left the shores and went into coastal waters, you left yourself open to the large sea creatures that called them home. You'd be sailing right into a nest of over a monsters, and even a large fleet wasn't guaranteed to make it through safely. Even the spear tuna that was such a delight at our dinner banquet was a tough foe to face in open water. If one rammed your ship at 60 knots, or nearly 70 miles an hour, it would easily tear a huge hole in the vessel. But even a steel-sided ship couldn't breathe easy, because among the creatures in the ocean, a spear tuna was still on the small side. These creatures lacked intelligence but brutally attacked anyone who dared intrude into their territory. There wasn't a military vessel on this world that could take a ramming from their 30-foot-long bodies and stay afloat. Thus, only merchants with an intricate knowledge of safe sea routes dared to cross the ocean. So what about the Canaan Mountains option? Well, that'd involve traversing a hellscape known as the Dragon's Nest. Dragons are willing to let a merchant caravan go by unharmed, but something bigger, say, a large army, was a great way to invite their wrath upon you. They weren't human, so negotiation was out of the question. If they mistakenly decided you were hostile, it was all over. These dragons were led by a powerful dragon lord, and if they had you in their sights, they'd pare down your army well before you had a chance to fight your war. If you won, then fine, if you lost, the whole world would laugh at you. And even if you did beat those dragons, you had the western nation's forces waiting for you on the other side. The feature presentation, in other words. Besides, a military march through rugged mountains was an ordeal in itself. The path only opened up in the middle of the summer anyway. When the snow and ice settled onto those frigid peaks, all the magic in the world wouldn't get you through. No, any strategist who hadn't lost his marbles would avoid this route at all costs. Thus, your only choice left was through the forest of Jura. But, the forest is the territory of a demon lord, and that's me. And there's Veldora, too, right? Yeah, and now that the whole world knows of the Storm Dragon's awakening, the Empire can't afford to make any funny moves. They feared him even when he was still banished, so right now, they're essentially frozen in place. Exactly. We had spread the news that Veldora destroyed the Pharmus army, and the Empire heard about that quite some time ago, I'm sure. Any ambitions they had along those lines must have been shelved by now. The Empire had feared Veldora for ages, and that fear made them too careful for their own good. If they had acted sooner, they might just have wiped us out, for all I know. But now Veldora's here, and Veldora was chiefly why Raphael assured me we were golden. Report. That was a prediction, not a conclusion. The situation is constantly changing. If I obtain new information, I will need to factor that into my assumptions. Wow. What a worry wart. But that was fair. Working on bad assumptions can lead to some serious pitfalls later. It is true that the Empire is making some ominous moves. The shadows I tried as familiars have proven pretty useless, so I was thinking we had better conduct a more thorough investigation soon. However, Soei's time was already occupied with exploring the Western nations underground, and members from Team Kurayami were carrying out their own missions as well. About all he could do was send out shadows, low-level apparition creatures that ranked AD but could use shadow motion and thought communication, making them perfect spies. On paper, at least. Unfortunately, they were too weak to penetrate the barrier that protected the Empire. It was hard, however, to send over anyone stronger than them. If I was deploying people to places with unknown security situations, that limited my applicant list to those Soe could vouch for. And if I detached any of those people from their current missions, that would hinder my orders. Soe was talented but not omnipotent. Even after his evolution, he could only deploy up to six replications of himself at once. Those were the trump cards he used to carry out the dangerous work I always sent him off to. 
He needed to leave some on tap in case a battle broke out, so if I sent any of those to the Empire, I'm sure he'd worry over who would be left to guard me. The Empire's moves really aren't being looked at that seriously, though. It's more of a cover story, an excuse for letting Tempest into the Council, that's being spread around by a few of the louder representatives. But if you're that concerned, Sir Soe, I could conduct some investigations myself. Ooh, I see that Hanada, like Raphael, doesn't like trusting her own thoughts too much. I always knew how wary she was, but seeing that in action, I kinda had to admire it. I could learn from it, in fact. But now she's volunteering to help investigate, huh? I might as well take her up on that. Report. Please ask her to look into the armed nation of Dorgon as well and see whether military activity is possible within its underground cities. Raphael never wavers, does it? Now it's trying to work Hanada to the ground, too. But that made sense to me. The Canaan Mountains had some paths that led into the Dwarven Kingdom, the territory of Gazel. I couldn't imagine the Empire can do much with those roads, but it'd be worth looking into, just in case. Could I ask a favor when you do, Hanada? What's that? I'd kinda like you to investigate the structure of the Dwarven Kingdom, I think. Right, the Dwarven Kingdom's a city crafted from a cave underneath the Canaan Mountains. Hmm. That could be a possibility, too. You act so careless, but I really can't let my guard down around you, can I? Right? All right, I'll look into the Dwarven Kingdom as well. I wasn't sure what prompted Hanada's admiration, but fine. I thought Raphael was carrying on about nothing, but there's no sure thing in this world. I was just thinking about how I needed to be more careful. If there's a weed bothering me, better to uproot it now rather than later, and if Hanada was volunteering, no reason to hold back. So we carefully went through the rest of our discussions, talking about closely held state secrets and other vital affairs in the early afternoon cafe space. We had a magical soundproof barrier over us, so nobody was going to eavesdrop on our conversation anyway. Skills can be so useful like that. Hanada was kind enough to brief me on a few other things, too. It seemed like a lot of people wanted to take advantage of us, and not just for military purposes. Humans, after all, were suspicious folk, I should know, I used to be one. That's why what Hanada told me made so much sense. I just want you to know, alright? There are people out there trying to use and abuse you, so don't let them shoehorn you into anything. I had to accept that as correct. Whether I would listen to that advice was another question. What do you mean, use and abuse me? Well, in terms of your military, at the very least. That's something I'd want from you, too, and that's what you want to see, right? As she put it, one condition for joining the council was that we'd be responsible for management of the entire forest of Jura. The member nations were unanimous on that, since we'd function as a bulwark against the empire. I got no problem with that. With fewer monsters out there, I'm sure we'll see more people challenge the labyrinth. We do want that, yeah. Better not freely admit it so much. I've had to deal with a lot of heads of state in my time, and let me tell you, they're clever. They might even ask you to station troops in their countries to keep monster damage down. Normally, allowing foreign troops to stay in your nation wasn't the kind of thing governments liked to see. But as Hanada put it, in a world where monsters were a universal threat, leaders wanted to retain as much war power as they could. Many of them weren't afraid to use other nations' troops for that, including the Western nation's Temple Knights. Proposal. You could deploy troops to their nations to create an obligation to you. If we were recognized as a nation, it made sense that we could deploy our army to foreign lands as a peacetime maneuver. If something came up, that'd make it easier to exercise our military authority. My home country back in my previous world took that strategy a lot. Ho, oh, I see, I see. That's not a bad idea, actually. Why don't I let them use us? I can't say I like letting them think they're taking advantage of us, but, yes. It's essentially giving influence to our nation, isn't it? I grinned as Benamaru and Soe voiced their agreement. Shuna kept up her own smile, and I suppose her lack of complaint meant she agreed. And if we were all on the same page, that meant I could do what I wanted tomorrow. Why are you looking all sinister? An exasperated Hanada asked. Guess she's reading my mind again. But she didn't say anything else, which I took as her tacit approval. That marked the end of our lunchtime discussion, but before she left, Hanada brought up something else, as if she had just thought of it. Oh, right, I think there's also a group planning to do something stupid at the event tomorrow, so be on the lookout for it, okay? Once again, she warned me not to lose my temper or lash out at anyone. What she meant, I suppose, is that the council wasn't a monolith, and I should treat everybody there as one and the same. 
Eesh. Why was she so concerned about a pacifist like me? She didn't need to say it, I understood just fine. So I told her she was worrying too much, and we left it at that. The next day came. We were heading over to the council's meeting hall, Benamaru, Soe, Shuna, and me, all in suits and looking sharp. It goes without saying that all our weapons were in my stomach, so at a glance, it would have looked like we were unarmed. Hanada had given me her full briefing, so I didn't have an iota of anxiety. Maybe a few counselors wanted to take advantage of us, but on the question of my admission to the council, all my worries were behind me. If I was recognized as a friend to humankind here, that'd be one step closer to the ideal society I had in mind, a world where man and monster coexisted and shared in one another's prosperity. To borrow a phrase from Majuran, a monster and man cooperative alliance. On the monster side, we already had magic born, dwarves, elves, and more living with one another. That alone already resulted in a massive new economic sphere, but as an ex-human, I really wanted to reach out to them as well. But humans, you know, they're greedy. It's all what do I get out of this? With them, and they're willing to shut out their own countrymen just for thinking the wrong thing. But that greed helps them improve their lives, too, and it's the engine driving all sorts of new and expanding entertainment. They weren't simple to deal with. Not like monsters. Better avoid expecting too much here. I couldn't assume this would go great from the very beginning. When I reached the council hall, several counselors were there to greet me. They were from our border nations, and based on what they heard from the Founders Festival participants, they wanted to forge friendlier relations with me. I sure appreciated all the compliments, and I responded in kind, figuring it best for the future. They started smiling at me, the ice now firmly broken. I heard you were a demon lord, Sir Rimuru, but what I didn't hear about was how much of a sociable leader you are. I would certainly like to maintain a friendly relationship with you, going forward. No, no, the pleasure's all mine. I've got a slate of events in mind going forward, so if you're interested, please feel free to attend. That's it for this video guys. Thank you for always watching my videos and supporting my channel. Shout out to Nightgazer, Luminoseka, Fennec Foxy, Akash Barwa, Skynet, Rahul Subramanian, Pickle Rick, Mike Lewis, Izvestia Pieris, and last but not least, shout out to Envy. I'll see you guys in the next video.